basic technology to get us off the ground. Fill a cylinder with volatile chemicals. Contact! Then ignite them in a controlled explosion. The force of the blast is what pushes the rocket up. Nowadays, chemical rockets are the only ones with enough thrust to overcome Earth's gravity and carry a payload into orbit. But they're not very efficient. The heavier the payload, the more fuel a rocket needs to lift it into space. But the more fuel a rocket carries, the more fuel it needs. For long-range missions, most spacecraft rely on their initial launch speed to essentially coast to their destination. Flight planners often design routes that give the craft a gravity assist by sending it around the moon or another planet. One small cadre of scientists believes it has a quicker and more efficient way to get around in space. Dr. Ben Longmire and his team from the University of Michigan have traveled to Fairbanks, Alaska to play a small part in a much larger push to revolutionize space travel and exploration. The team plans to use helium balloons to send components of a new type of rocket engine to an altitude of over 30 kilometers, above 99% of Earth's atmosphere. The purpose is to test these components within the harsh environment of space. While astronauts train to live and work in zero gravity, or to move around in bulky spacesuits, these would-be space explorers are preparing to negotiate some of Earth's harshest environments. Once they launch their payload, they have to retrieve it wherever it comes down in Alaska's vast snowy wilderness. The idea they are pursuing is nothing short of revolutionary. It's a type of rocket that promises far greater gas mileage than other rockets and enough power to reach distant targets. It runs on the same fuel that nature uses, literally, to power the universe. To understand it, we go back to the early moments of time and space. Not long after its explosive beginnings, the universe was awash in vast stores of hydrogen gas. But even as the universe continued to expand, gravity began to draw clumps of matter into ever denser concentrations. The earliest stars took shape, immense balls of hydrogen gas, hundreds of times the mass of our sun. As they contracted inward, they heated up and ignited. Intense radiation now began to flow through the voids. That had the effect all through the universe of stripping electrons away from the primordial gas. The universe became filled not with solids, liquid, or gas, but with a fourth state of matter, plasma. On our planet, plasma occurs only in rare circumstances. In a hot flame, a bolt of lightning, or in a blown electrical transformer. Made up of negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions, plasma is in most cases electrically neutral since the charges balance each other out. That led the physicist Irving Langmuir in the 1920s to compare it to the clear liquid plasma that carries blood cells through our bodies. The development of radio led to the discovery, high above the Earth, of a natural plasma ceiling, the ionosphere. It hovers above us, 
reflecting some radio frequencies and absorbing others. The discovery of immense radiation belts beyond our atmosphere opened the way to the study of plasma in space. Unlike most matter on Earth, plasma conducts electricity and responds to magnetic fields. These properties influence the formation of structures like galaxies and nebulae. They power high-velocity jets that roar out of newborn stars or black holes. Studies of one giant nearby ball of plasma show what a complex and volatile substance it can be. In the core of our sun, high heat and crushing pressures cause hydrogen atoms to crash together. That sets off a nuclear reaction in which hydrogen atoms fuse into heavier ones like helium and carbon, generating heat. This heat slowly rises to the surface of the sun in vast plumes of plasma. You can see evidence of this process called convection in a pattern of ever-evolving blobs known as granules. They are like the tops of thunderstorms. Even as energy builds within, the sun's gravity and density can stifle its escape. What carries it out are magnetic fields generated by the rising and sinking motion of hot plasma. They twist and wrap around, channeling energy to the surface. The fields can power immense loops of hot gas, about 60,000 degrees Celsius, then rise up from the solar surface and fall back. The sun can also erupt in giant waves of plasma that fly out from its surface. Called coronal mass ejections, they can reach up to six million miles per hour as they hurtle out across the solar system. When the solar wave strikes, it slams into Earth's own magnetic field. Because solar particles are charged, a portion follows the orientation of Earth's magnetic field lines. Finding an opening at the poles, they race down into the atmosphere. You know this is happening when you see the beautiful lights of the Aurora Borealis in the far north, or the Aurora Australis in the south. They appear when charged solar particles collide with oxygen molecules in the upper atmosphere, causing them to glow blue, red, and green depending on altitude. Flying through a zone called the thermosphere, some 350 kilometers above the Earth, astronauts in the International Space Station watch in awe as the aurora shimmers, framed by the glow of stars and cities at night. It's the explosive properties of plasma that have motivated the collaboration between NASA, Ben's team, and a company that he's affiliated with.
the Adastra Rocket Company of Houston, Texas. Because plasma does not occur naturally on Earth, the challenge is to create it, then harness it in a rocket engine. In the lab, the teams do this by injecting argon gas into a chamber. They bombard it with radio waves, which strip electrons from the gas and turn it into a plasma. The soup of electrons and ions accelerates as it moves through a magnetic field generated by superconducting magnets. Then it's hit with a second blast of radio waves that heats it up to a million degrees Celsius. This hot plasma blasts out the back and propels the craft. Okay. That's our ultimate goal. As okay. part of their design so, so process, the Ben and his team are testing some of the specialized components yeah, of their rocket right. yeah. in the harsh environment right of space. So we should just do A simple frame will carry an array of novel sensors. One holds a colony of bacteria. The idea is that the bacteria itself can detect radiation. So it, it mutates in a certain way or in a very known way that when you send it into an environment with uh, a lot of cosmic rays and a lot of um, perhaps x-rays from the aurora itself, um, it mutates. And so we'll detect sort of the level of radiation that it's exposed to um, by looking at these mutations after we recover the bacteria from flying it to the edge of space in these balloon capsules. Another is a series of tiny GoPro cameras converted to record the intensity of infrared and ultraviolet light normally hidden to the human eye. Argon gas is used to insulate instruments against the cold, with chemical packets added for warmth. The frame is stabilized with tiny gyroscopes and outfitted with GPS devices for tracking. The idea of using plasma to power rockets is not a new one. The Polish physicist Stanislaw Ulam is said to have been inspired by atom bomb tests in the 1940s. He speculated that waves of plasma from small nuclear detonations could propel a spacecraft to extreme speeds. In the 1950s, that idea 